in chapter two, we were talking about the production possibility curves. When we look at chapter three and we're looking at the gains from trade, we're looking at two linear production possibility curves. And in this case, we're looking at uh, Frank the Farmer and Ruby the Rancher. And we're going to show how both can be better off through trade by specializing on the product that they have the least opportunity cost in producing. Um, if you live in the mountains, and you grow apples, you know, you're not going to, if you want shrimp, you're going to go buy shrimp from somebody that does it every day. Because they have the economies of scale and they produce the cost because they, their, their ability to do the work. But that's just like when we look at trade, whether it's between two people in the same county, same city, same state, or different countries. Trade can help everybody receive more products and at a better price and usually higher quality. So in looking at chapter three, they're just gonna put some numbers to what we looked at in chapter two with the production possibility curves. And I'm gonna to go to their PowerPoint. And in this chapter, why do people and nations choose to be economically independent? How to trade, make everyone better off? What is absolute advantage, comparative advantage, and concepts? How are they similar and how are they different? I can have an absolute advantage on producing everything, but I cannot have a comparative advantage over everything. As a nation, if we were trading with Chile, we probably have an absolute advantage on computers, automobiles, et cetera. And we would have an absolute advantage, but we can't, we don't have a comparative advantage. And we'll see that when we start looking at Ruby the rancher and Frank the farmer. But these are the main things we're gonna be looking at in this chapter. Asking the experts, remember we talked about the economists, they never agree on anything. Or just seem to not agree on everything 100%. This is one they all agree 100%. The trade with China makes most Americans better off. Notice it doesn't say all, it says most. Because there's always going to be somebody that is injured by the trade. Because of the reduced cost of producing goods in China, somebody making a T-shirt in North Carolina can't compete with the same price or cost structure that they have in China when their wages are probably 200% lower than what we have in North Carolina, if not more, if they use prison labor. When we look at trade, we look at interdependence, we allow many people around the world to produce goods. Remember, we looked at the, we saw the video, uh, Eye of the Pencil. And it showed how much inter or interdependence existed just to make a simple product, like a pencil. It didn't matter if we liked each other or had the same religion or socioeconomic conditions or standard of living. We still had everything end up at one spot at one time on one machine to produce a pencil. And it can make everyone better off from the rubber producers to the uh, lumberjacks. Look at the mining of graphite. So everyone will be better off as long as they get the price they expect. Now, if they're, if they're forced labor, it doesn't, they're not better off. 
this is one of the 10 principles of chapter one. We make assumptions. We're looking at just two countries, two goods, and one resource. And anytime we're looking at comparing two countries and two products, we also have to make sure we're measuring using the same resource. I can't use labor to measure U.S. production and uh, electrical usage for the production of goods in Canada. We have to look at the common resource. If it's labor, it has to be labor. It can't be time. We can't compare. You know, if we're going to look at uh, individual product, we can compare them to each other, but they have to be the same from both countries. We, in this process, we want to know how much we can produce, how much we want to produce, and how much we need. Now, in this example, they said the U.S. economy has 50,000 labor hours per month available for production. And they produce only two goods, airplanes and soybeans. To produce one airplane requires 500 hours of labor. So if you divide 50,000 by 500, what are you going to get? You get one five, well, one five hundred of an airplane to make. Uh, what is the product? They're going to ton of soybeans, 10 hours of labor. So it'll take what, 50 hours or one fiftieth of an hour of an airplane to make a ton of soybeans. We need a, a little matrix down here where you can start inputting your numbers, especially when you get into the end of the chapter and you start looking at comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. You can see in this case, they can look at consumption without trade and with trade and the gains of trade, etc. But you can here and place all your numbers in here you go ahead and get your ratios of what the cost or the opportunity car cost are from going from one good to the next. To produce one ton of soybeans, it takes 10 hours. And if we look at this set up, employment, labor hours, and production. 50,000 hours is 100 airplanes, 40,000 is 80, 25 is 50, 10,000 is 20. But that same amount of labor, look at the soybeans that can be produced with the same amount of labor. So when we break it down, if we put it on two axes, we put the soybeans on the X axis, the airplanes on the Y axis. And we could go back to this, because what it's telling us is if we produce 40,000, I mean, use 40,000 hours on airplanes to produce 80 airplanes, we can use 10,000 hours for soybeans and produce 1,000 tons of soybeans. So we're going to produce directly on the curve based on the information that we have. But that information we received on the previous chart is just plotted here. And this shows us a linear curve. Now we can produce any combination uh, as long as it equals, what is it, the total? 50,000 hours of labor. We can do it in any combination with soybeans and airplanes. We can produce at any point inside of here, but we would be inefficient to produce here. We can produce, we cannot produce outside this production possibility curve. 
That's where we're going to see where trade makes us better off. Suppose the U.S. uses half of its labor on airplanes and the other half on soybeans. That means and that's what we desire to consume. 50 airplanes and 2,500 tons of soybeans. If we look at another country and bring them into equation, because we've looked at one country, we looked at the U.S. with 50,000 hours of labor. Japan only has 30,000 hours of labor, but their resources are different to some degree. You know, their equipment, the facilities, technologies, they're all a little bit different. For Japan to produce a ton of soybeans, it takes 25 hours of labor, where in the U.S. it took 10. To produce one airplane, it's 625 hours of labor when in the U.S. it required 500. We can see that the U.S. has an absolute advantage on both of these products. It takes less time to build an airplane and less time to produce a ton of soybeans. So if we go to the graph for Japan, they can produce 48 airplanes, with the hours that they have, they have 30,625. So that gives them 48 airplanes, or if they produce no airplanes, they can produce 1,200 tons of soybeans, or any combination within this production possibility frontier. But on this curve, they are technically efficient. In Japan, their consumption desire is to be at 24 airplanes and 600 tons of soybeans. So we can see where they want to be. And if they have no outside trade, this is where they're going to be at, at 24 and 600. So without trade, we can see that 500, we can produce 50 airplanes in the U.S. and 2,500 tons of soybeans, the Japanese we get 24 airplanes and 600 tons of soybeans. That's without trade. Now, if we bring trade into the equation, we're going to look at different production levels. The U.S. produces 3,500 tons of soybeans. How many airplanes can the U.S. produce with the remaining resources? It's going to have us draw the PPF, and we'll see that in a moment. The same thing with Japan. So U.S. production with trade, if we produce 3,500 tons of soybeans requiring 3,500 times 10, we can still produce 30 airplanes. And we see that here. There's 50 minus the 35,000 is 1,500. Japan. If they produce only 48 airplanes, it requires all their resources of 48 times 625, which is 30,000. And they produce no tons of wheat. Now, the U.S. is going to want some of those airplanes because their original desire for airplanes in the U.S. was what? 50 and 2,500 tons of soybeans. So now we're sitting at 30 and 3,500. 3, and Japan is sitting there with no soybeans. Now, if the U.S. exports goods to Japan, say soybeans and exchange them for airplanes, we're going to be better off. And they will be as well. And the exports of goods produced domestically and sent out to them. So we would produce the soybean, soybeans, send it to Japan. We have huge economies of scale on soybeans. So, of course, we can make it at a more efficient cost and a lower opportunity cost in Japan with limited areas to grow soybeans. Now, 
The U.S. will export, let's say they export 880 tons of soybeans and import 22 airplanes. So Japan will be exporting 22 airplanes and importing 880 tons of soybeans. We can now see the U.S. is better off. We produced 30 airplanes. We imported 22 for a total of 52 airplanes. Soybeans, we produced 3,500. We shipped out 8, 880 tons. We now have a remainder of 3,620 tons. We can now see that our level of output with trade is outside the production possibility curve. That was unattainable when we were by ourselves. So we see the movement moving outward. With the additional production, we should see a reduction in the cost of the airplanes and the cost of the soybeans. Now, Japan, the same scenario occurs. They originally wanted and consumed 24 airplanes. Now they have 26 because they exported 22. They started with 48, they ended up with 22. They imported 880 tons. They normally wanted 600 tons, and now they get another 280 tons of soybeans. So trade has made both of these countries much better off than they would have without trade. We can go to this matrix here, and we can see consumption without it, without trade. The airplanes 50, and 50 in consumption with trade was 52, a gain of two. See a 120 ton gain in soybeans US, gain of two airplanes and 280 tons of soybeans for the Japanese. We are both better off from trade. If you want to see what happens when somebody does not trade, look at North Korea. Their standard of living is extremely low. And individuals who have crossed the line, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, they were full of parasites and worms, their bodies were, even alive. And in hospitals, they, they had parasites that normally we wouldn't see because they're acquired by eating products that are fertilized with human waste. In fact, in North Korea, there's a mandate that you have to produce so much human waste in a given period of time, or you can pay somebody to do it for you. It's a very impoverished and very authoritarian system. So with no trade, they are a good example of how bad it can get. As we talked about at the very beginning, the absolute advantage, the ability to produce a good using fewer inputs than the other producer. We build airplanes with 500 hours versus 625 hours. We produce a ton of soybeans with 10 hours versus 25 hours. So we had absolute advantage on both products. but we don't have a comparative advantage on both products. And the reason that Japan will specialize on airplanes is because their opportunity cost producing airplanes is less than their cost to produce soybeans. And it's reversed when you go to the US. This is just a basic definition of the comparative advantage. And the principle of comparative advantage, each good should be produced by the individual that has a smaller opportunity cost of producing that good. It just makes sense. If the person in the mountains wants seafood, you know, they're not going to stop growing their Christmas trees and run down to the coast, catch shrimp, and drive back. They'll trade. If there's not a monetary system, they'll trade. Christmas tree for shrimp or flounder or oyster, whatever they may want. 
The U.S. can produce one airplane with 500 hours of labor. They can produce one ton of soybeans with 10 hours of labor. So now what we're going to do, since we're dealing with the same products from the same countries, from two different countries, we're going to look at what their opportunity cost is from producing one product to the next. If we produce one airplane and use 500 hours to produce soybeans, we can produce 500 over 10, 50 tons of soybeans. So the opportunity cost for one airplane is 50 tons of soybeans. And vice versa. The opportunity cost for one to uh, ton of soybeans is 0 0.02 airplanes. In Japan, the opportunity cost for one airplane is 25 tons of soybeans. But for if they give up one ton of soybeans, they get four tenths of uh, 100 of the airplane. So their opportunity cost for airplanes is much lower than it is in the United States. Their cost of total in soybeans is 25, whereas in the United States is 50. Therefore, Japan should be producing the airplanes. On the other hand, when we look at the tons of soybeans, the opportunity cost in the U.S. is much less than what it is in Japan. So the U.S. needs to make or produce the soybeans. Now the numbers in trade, yeah, they were given what the trade amount was going to be, but you still determine who was going to produce what. You had to go through the process of looking at the opportunity cost, what they give up for one ton of soybeans or one airplane. So the opportunity cost of producing one airplane, one ton of soybeans. Japan, like I said, 25 tons of soybean, soybeans, less than 50 hours, less than the 50 in the U.S. And the comparative advantage on soybeans, the U.S. was less than Japan. If there, if all their opportunity costs were equal, there will be no benefit in trade. But based on what we saw with Japan, even though it costs them more to produce an airplane, they specialize in airplanes as it relates to soybeans. It's because when we look at the factors of production, land, or gifts of nature, they just don't have it compared to the United States. When you look at the Midwest and eastern parts of the United States. When countries trade, the world's economic pie gets bigger. The price of trade must lie between the opportunity cost. We have 22 airplanes traded for 80, 80 tons of soybeans. So the price of the trade of one airplane for 40 tons of soybeans. So when we look at the, so the, the cost, and they have the comparative advantage on the airplanes. Argentina and Brazil, producing coffee, requires two hours, producing a bottle of wine is four. Brazil, producing coffee requires one hour, producing one bottle of wine requires five. We can see Brazil has an absolute advantage on the coffee, and Argentina has an absolute advantage on the wine. Comparative advantage, we have to look at what they give up. For a pound of coffee, it's one fifth bottle of wine. Argentina, coffee, it's, it's one half. So clearly, Brazil needs to be producing 
the coffee, and Argentina will produce the wine. And that's what it's doing here. It's just taking you through the process, showing you what's going on. Now, just like we looked at the, the, the example, I mean, the experts at the beginning of the chapter, uh, it said some of the most Americans we benefited by trade with China, it was 100%. Now, on the reverse side, we say trade between China and the United States. Some Americans who work in the production of competing goods, such as clothing, furniture, are made worse off by trade with China. 99% agree, 96% agree. Now, 4% are probably saying that even though they don't have a job, the cost of the clothing and, fur clothing and furniture they buy is cheaper. Excuse me, but I'm sure the individuals much rather have the job than cheaper furniture and clothing. Uh, these are things we can look at. The candidate says we need to start form, flow, stop the flow, flow of farm steel in our country. We can place a tariff on the import of steel. Our domestic steel production will rise. The U.S. will be better off. In 2016, there was a a tariff placed on steel, any steel imported into the United States. And the reasoning behind it was they said that it was national security. And if ever the U.S. would have to go to war, they would need their own capacity to produce steel, or we would. Foreign steel had become cheaper and cheaper over the years. Therefore, we were enjoying the low-cost steel when we were building buildings, automobiles, and other items. Now, when that tariff was put in place, the price of steel went up. The price of building went up. The price of cars went up, et cetera. There were countries that were very upset that the, the trade, you know, they had done a lot of trade with the U.S. with steel, the European Union and Canada, they were very upset. So we had to come to an agreement on what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. But we do have a, a very strong steel industry in the U.S. now because of those tariffs. Whether you agree or disagree with the reasoning behind the tariff, that's something that can be dated, debated in your policy analysis. But that's what we did. Now, it was everybody better off, not if you're building a building or buying a car. But as far as national security was concerned, it was believed that it, it did the job. This chapter in a nutshell. Interdependence and trade are desirable. <clears throat> we talked about comparative advantage, absolute advantage. How, <coughs> excuse me, and how they do make us better off. We will look at tariffs, we'll look at quotas and the reasoning behind tariffs and quotas and the impact it has on the consumer and on the marketplace. A lot of that is in the macro side, but we will look at it in the micro as well. Any questions about comparative and absolute advantage? Because I want to look at, this is the example they give in your book, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> and they're looking at the farmer, friend of the farmer, and Ruby the rancher. And they're comparing two products, meat and potatoes. Now there has to be a standard in which they all are compared to. 
something that is measurable. It could be labor, but in this case, it's time. And when we look at the production opportunities, we can look at Frank the farmer in 60 minutes, they can produce an ounce of meat. <clears throat> 15 minutes, they can produce an ounce of potatoes, which means they can produce eight ounces of meat a day or 32 ounces of potatoes a day. We convert it to eight hours. Ruby the rancher, 20 minutes for an ounce of meat, 10 minutes for an ounce of potatoes. So they can produce 24 ounces of meat and 48 ounces of potatoes. Who has absolute advantage on meat? That was a question. William? Elizabeth? Doesn't Ruby have an absolute advantage? Why? Because he can produce more. With less what? Time. Time. Now, as we said before, you can have an absolute advantage on everything. But you're not going to have a comparative advantage on both. Now, based on these production possibility curves, they say PPF, which is referencing the area in on and inside that curve. That's the production possibility frontier. If Frank produces only meat, he can produce eight and 32 potatoes. Ruby, she can produce 24 ounces of meat and 48 ounces of potatoes that they focus solely on that product. Now, they have decided that their consumption levels, what they want is actually half. So, Frank needs four ounces of meat and 16 ounces of potatoes for consumption. Ruby needs 12 ounces of meat and, 30, and 24 ounces of potatoes. So, let's look at what they can do. Without trade, we can see the production levels. With trade, if Frank produced no meat, 32 ounces of potatoes, and Ruby produced 18 ounces of meat and 12 ounces of potatoes, and then they trade five ounces, well, Frank would get five ounces and gives away 15 ounces. Ruby would give away five, ounces of meat and receive 15 ounces of potatoes. In both cases, with both Frank and Ruby, they are both better off with trade. Ruby will see the greatest advantage, especially on the potatoes, but everyone is better off and all of them are now consuming at a level that it exceeds their own ability to produce goods. And we can see that at the point B, that's the consumption with trade. So Ruby, she's gonna have more meat, potatoes available, and, and so will Frank. Now here we can look at the opportunity cost. Now we're comparing the product to each other. We're taking, not looking at the minutes, we're looking at their production. Frank the farmer with four ounces of potatoes, and you have up a quarter ounce of meat. Ruby the rancher, two ounces of potatoes, and a half ounce of meat. If we go back to the previous, we can see that based on the meat, Frank is not producing any. Ruby's producing the meat. And Frank is producing 
the actual potatoes. Because he has a comparative advantage to produce the potatoes. For an ounce of potatoes, they give up a quarter ounce of meat. So they have the lowest opportunity cost for producing this good. And Ruby the Rancher has a comparative advantage on potatoes. For one ounce of meat, they give up only two potatoes. That determines who needs to produce what. Now, who came up with the number of 32 for Frank and 13 and or 18 and 12 for Ruby. The, when you see those examples in your book and the homework, it'll be, they'll be, those numbers will be there somewhere. They'll tell you what the trade changes to. If not, you'll just have to play with the numbers. But I guarantee you, if it's based on a comparative advantage, like we see here, where one has a comparative advantage on potatoes and Ruby has it on the meat. There will be a point where they're both better off with trade. Any questions about that? Um, I don't have a question about that per se, but when I was going through um, chapter two, yes. I was having a hard time um, trying to separate, like, I don't know if it was just because of how I was saying it or what, but uh, trying to separate the relationships of um, firms and households. Okay. So I think one I got wrong was, um, it just said someone's name pays so and so much to take piano lessons. And I think I put household to firm or like when uh employee gets paid i put firm to household but i i don't know what i did wrong i just okay let me see if i can pull it up i believe it's honestly that example i just gave was um on problems and applications chapter two it was just problems and applications Yes, sir. Question one, not for chapter okay. two. No, patience. I'm going directly to this. I'm going to go to the student view. Weekly assignments. Number two. Which one was it you were looking at? Um, it's chapter two, problems and applications. Let me see if I can find it on my, yeah, that looks right. Yeah. And then if it has like the little things where you get three attempts for each one, then it's yeah. what I was looking at. This comes up just like your homework does. Yep, that's the one. Each of the following activities identify the flow of the dollars as either household to firm or firm to household. This is going to be what? Storekeeper pays. Uh, Kyoto, Kyoko pays storekeeper two dollars per quarter yogurt. That is household to firm. Yep, that's what I would put. Um, Money plays one hundred dollars for a piano lesson. That'll be a household of firm. Earns profit from the grocery store. That's from the household. Ten hours, ten dollars an hour. Because both of these are part of the factors of production. And when in this textbook, we can hit read it now. We got them all right. Okay, can I can I read um, the ones that I got wrong and you tell me where I went off? Okay. So, well, I'm not sure how it works. I think I might have just missed one question and it just marked them all wrong. So, shouldn't have done that. 
we should have got three quarters or something in that order, but go ahead. So for Caroline pays a stock keeper $1 for a quart of milk, I put household to firm. Correct. For Latasha earns 20000 from her 10% ownership of Acme Industri Industrial, I put firm to household. That might not right. be. Right. Because that's capital. Um, for... Francis spends one hundred dollars for a piano lesson. I put household to firm. Correct. And Antonio earns eight dollars per hour working at a fast food restaurant. I put firm to household. Correct. I got that. I got that one wrong. Like that, my it, I got zero points for that question, and those were all my answers. Do you, do you want firm to household on hourly rate? I went firm to household on hourly rate. I went household to firm on someone buying piano lessons. Um, the capital, the 10% capital, I said firm to household. And then Caroline buying milk, I said household to firm. But I got the question wrong. So I didn't know. If, so the, the piano lessons and, and the, the, the quarter yogurt are household to firm. You got the other two is from the household. Is that correct? Piano lessons. Yeah. It, it should have given him credit for it, but it's not gradable, but uh, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, there are mistakes in here. This is the ninth edition. It just, this is the first semester of it being used. So in some of these exercises, we'll find some errors. If you think something's wrong, do a print screen, send it to me. We'll resolve it. Or do a print screen, well, send it to me and I'll make sure that when the class comes up, I show it to everyone. All right. uh, and it's the same thing if you have a test question that you're not sure of. Don't stop taking the test because it's an hour, a time test of an hour and 20 minutes. But go ahead and do a print screen. And then we can resolve whatever it is. If it's a bad question, I'll delete it. And when I delete it, anybody that has that question, we'll get it, we'll get it removed from their, their test. But I won't remove it, I'll just give them credit for it. So it, it Joshua, it sounds like you you got one that had it's got an error in it. Is, if they're spending hundred dollars for piano lessons and money for a quart of yogurt, yeah, that's definitely household firm. And then the last two is from the household. You can see it here. I'm trying the version where we get three attempts. It's coming up with a new one. Earns from ownership and family business. That's Purchase of production. What do you want a haircut? Excuse me, services. And services and then factors of production. It's different than the original one. The original one was looking at direction. This actually has you graded out. So this shouldn't be that uh, you would think there wouldn't be any errors in it, but there, there, there can be errors. We can go through this one. It's ownership. It's what? From the household, from the household, household firm, and household firm. How about um, um, oh. Let's see. How come oh. money isn't a factor of production? What is it doing here? Please talk to you. I think it sells the market's goods and services, therefore. Uh, 
oh, they're looking at the goods and services, not the flow. That may be what you have. They're looking at the movement of the goods and services. That would be the opposite direction. The movement of goods and services? Yeah. They want to know where the goods and services are going, not the dollars. I don't understand that. So if they're paying you, if you're paying someone for services, you're giving them your money in exchange for what? Their services. So it's how it's from the household. Storekeeper, a dollar of milk is going to give you, you're giving them a dollar in exchange for the goods and services. So it's going to, the goods and services are going to be moving from the firm to the household. That's the reason yours were marked wrong. So it's not about where the money is going. It's where the it's not the money. It's the goods and services. Okay. Um, I also it's have actually going backwards on the curve. Uh, I didn't. I didn't read it, and I got it wrong. So be careful when you read. It. You may look at yours and find that your that's where yours was an error. Is that what yours says, Justin? Um, let me see. I clicked on another test because I was looking for other questions I might add. How come money isn't a factor of production? Uh, that's a macro type question, but money, you can't define money and you can't truly, yeah, it's, it's, it's an inanimate object. Uh, it's worth what we say it's worth or what our, the people consuming it say it's worth. Because uh, all it is is a, a piece of paper with ink on it. But we all agree that it has X amount of value. And the governments around the world, they give us an exchange rate. So we can measure money. And we can look at the characteristics of money. There are standard of count, means of measure. But we, you can't truly define money. What we can do is, is look at the movement of whatever we exchange. It could be Deutschmarks, it could be pesos, it could be rios, euros, pounds, Canadian dollars, because it's a standard of accounts. It's just another unit of measure, just like time. When you produce a product, you set a value on it. If I like it, I'll buy it. If I don't, I'll vote with my dollars and walk away. I don't know if that explained or answered your question, but it, it's it's a commodity, just like anything else. When you look at the uh, Bitcoin market, that's all that is. It's an imaginary currency. It has value. Do you think there's real money in Bitcoin? Bitcoin? Excuse me? Do you don't think there's real money in Bitcoin? Uh, as far as backing, no. There's no gold standard or anything backing them up. In fact, in a lot of cases with Bitcoin, you don't even know who's running the markets. And there's been numerous Bitcoin markets that have failed. And people have walked away with nothing. Because, so, like, I was in Cincinnati and at this, like, outlet, and there's, like, a Bitcoin place where you turn in Bitcoin and get cash. Yes. If you had Bitcoins. Yeah. And you could change cash for Bitcoins and Bitcoins for cash. That was just, evidently there was someone in that, that area that accepted Bitcoins over cash or vice versa. But that, that, that relationship changes daily as far as the value of that Bitcoin. Isn't it kind of like a stock? Like it just goes up and down depending on the value of the day? Well, yes and no. I, there are some Bitcoins that are traded that are, are more secure than others, but I still oh, consider them all high risk. There's different types of Bitcoin? Oh, yes, absolutely. There's different markets, different Bitcoins. Even uh, Facebook wanted to get in uh, Zuckerberg and create their own coin, basically uh, Facebook currency. 
so there's a lot of different Bitcoin markets. What makes it go up and down so much is, is basically the law of supply and demand. The more people want a given Bitcoin, the higher the value is going to be. The demand will increase. Now, if a lot of shares, Bitcoin shares go off the marketplace and there's still the same demand, that'll drive the price up as well. But a lot of the up and down is just volatility. Uh, it's just like when we look at gold and silver and some other commodities. If there's risk going on in the uh, stock market or there's a belief there's risk in the stock market, people will move to another commodity, gold, silver, etc. What is risky? Gold, a nugget. Uh, gold's trading over $2,000 an ounce today, and it was around $1,300 last year. Silver actually had a better gain. What's the price so, of silver right now? Which, uh, yesterday morning, I looked at it, it was like $2,878, but it was down a little bit. Uh, last year it was around 17. So it's had a pretty good rise. Anytime there's volatility in the markets, people flee to, to commodities or cash or euros. They, they look for stability in some of the markets. Would we be talking about the stock market in the class? Not, not a lot. Okay. Uh, I can give you some information on if you want to be looking at trading. Yes, but, sir, I am. Uh, dealing with stock market is like playing poker. Yeah, I've heard that. You the amount of money you're willing to lose. If you're willing to lose ten thousand dollars, that's what you carry with you. That's what you start with, and uh, it it can be risky. The more information you have, the better off you are. Uh, I saw lows this morning. Uh, they reported and, and their shares went up 5%. Home Depot reported yesterday and their earnings per share were you know, 50 cent higher than what was expected and their earnings were higher. Seems like everybody was at Lowe's and at Home Depot during quarantine trying to build something. Okay. Also saw that medical stocks went up. Isn't that right? Medical stocks? Yeah, like, like, you know, like, like medical stocks, companies that make, or uh, companies that make medicine that make, like, the COVID-19 vaccines and stuff, their stocks going up? Well, they're going up now on anticipation. Once it's realized whether it's positive or negative, mm -hmm. or whether they get it or they don't get it, you'll see their stock respond accordingly. Uh, if they're in the market to produce it and, and they don't come up with the the vaccine and their prices were inflated, they will fall. So right now, it's just, I don't care who gets it, get it to me. I'll take it. Even if there's, there's some questions. 